Hello and good morning, First Christian Church, Greenville. I am glad that you are here. Let's say good morning to Afton and South Green. Good morning, guys. Good morning to everyone who's joining us online, whether you're at home or on vacation. Uh, We are glad that you are here. We are going to be in Exodus chapter 17. And so uh, the Pulse said that we are in 17 verses 1 through 17. Um, But did you know there's not even a 17th verse in the chapter? Uh, So we are definitely going to blame that on Michael. It was definitely his fault in the Pulse. Uh, We are going through verses 1 through 7. And so turn with me there. And I'm just kidding. It's not Michael's fault either. But we're going to move on. We are in Exodus chapter 17, and while you are turning there, let me ask you a question. Have you ever forgotten something important, like really important, a spouse's uh, birthday or their anniversary or a child's birthday? Um, Maybe you're just really bad at names, remembering names. Scott Wakefield, our lead pastor, he is notoriously good at names. I've seen him remember names of people he's only met once or twice, and he didn't have to recall their name until a couple years later. He is really good at it. I will forget your name in five minutes, maybe 20. Uh, I have to work hard to remember things. I have to work hard to remember names. I have alarms set on my phone that go off during different parts of the day to remember to do different things. I have a complex calendar that I have to keep. Uh, Every Sunday, I am in the back of the worship center, and I am naming every person in the room, not because of some, um, like, cultish, I'm paying too close of attention to you or something, but because I've got to practice. I've got to practice if I am going to remember names. And so I don't know about you guys if you struggle with those things. So so saying that, let let me do say this one more thing. Please, after the service, do not come up to me and ask me if I remember your name. I do not need the stress of disappointing 12 people this morning uh, of not remembering your name. So uh, give me that grace. In our passage today, we are going to watch Israel not remember. We are going to watch them be extremely forgetful. And we're going to watch it, how it affects them and how it affects their relationship with God. So we are, uh, we've got a shorter passage, so we're going to read all of it at first, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get started together. So read along with me, silently on your part, out loud on my part. Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sign, not sin, by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Pray with me, friends. God, we praise you for the freedom that we have to gather. We praise you for being able to worship you, to study your word, to give you opportunity to transform our hearts with your word, and we ask that you do that 
this morning. Help me to think clearly. Help me to speak clearly to your glory so that you can use it to change us. Thank you, God. Amen. All right, so I'm going to do something different. I don't remember if I've done this before. Maybe I have. But I'm going to give you all of the answers up front, okay? I'm going to give you all of my main points. And I'm doing this for a couple reasons. Number one, because if you fall asleep and then wake back up, you can be like, oh, okay, I know where he is, and then just jump right back in. But also so that you can pass the test, because there's going to be a test afterward, and you need the answers, all right? Okay, not really a test. But here are my main points that I want you to write down. This is what we're going to talk about this morning. Number one, Israel needs to remember God's works. We need to remember God's works. Jesus did remember God's works. God wants us to remember his works. All right, we've read the passage. I gave you my points. We can go home. We are all done. No, we can't go home because I have one more hidden point in the sermon, and you cannot get an A on the exam without that one, and so uh, you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention. So let's talk about context really quick. In the previous chapter, Israel was hungry. God provided manna and quail, and he also provided a promise that he would provide it every single day day for their 40 years in the wilderness. And so they are literally experiencing daily miracles. They are literally experiencing daily miracles. Well, in our chapter today, the people get thirsty again, which kind of feels like deja vu because right before the manna experience, they got thirsty then, and God provided miraculously then. So they grumble against the Lord. And this is the fourth time. This is the fourth time that they've grumbled against the Lord. And they are pretty heated this time. So let's pick it up in verse 17, uh, Exodus 17, verse 1. And we'll dig deeper into this story. Verse 1. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of Sinai by stages. Sinai, Sinai. According to the commandment of the Lord and camped, At Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So, Rephidim is in the southern part of the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, Nobody lives there because it is a barren, rocky wasteland. It is a desert. So, because there's not a city, we don't know exactly like where it is, but in the southern area, southern region. All right. So, notice that the people are traveling by the commandment of God. He's telling them. To go to this place. He knows what it is. He knows it doesn't have water. This is according to his plan. He is testing the people, just like I'm going to test you later. He is testing the people to see if they have grown to a point of trusting the Lord yet. They've experienced his provision, his blessings, but do they trust yet? Let's see. Verse 2. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses. Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? So notice that author Moses uses the word quarrel instead of grumble. The other times that this has happened, it's been grumble, grumble, grumble. Now we're up to quarrel. Like things are escalating. And it's not stated just once, it's stated twice. And so in our, in our modern understanding, you know, if a modern editor would be editing this, they might scratch out that second quarrel and put a little note that says, like, too repetitious, find another creative action verb, or you know, something like that. But that editor wouldn't be getting the point. Ancient Near Eastern literature artists and editors, they would get the point. This double statement of quarrel is the author doubling down on just how quarrelsome they're being. Just how much they are ready to fight. So, Moses sees it for what it is. 
It's not just fighting and upsetness about Moses' leadership, but about God. They are testing the Lord. So let's dig a little deeper here. There are some very interesting things here. First, you might be wondering, what's the big deal? Like, if I had my family and I was in the desert, I also would be demanding water. I would also be very thirsty. Of course, everyone would. That's the point. But it's how they approach God. It's how they come to God. Israel says, give us water to drink. And even in just that statement, it's hard to see their rebellious heart. But it becomes clearer and clearer as we progress through our verses Eventually, we will see them ready to kill Moses over this. And then when we get to the last verse of our series, of our our section, we get even deeper into understanding their heart. It says that the people say, is the Lord among us or not? Like they are demanding proof. They are demanding God to prove himself. And here is the test. Here is the offense. In essence, they are saying, God, prove yourself or we're not following. They've already stated, hey, let's go back to Egypt. But they're saying, prove yourself or we're not following. We won't believe. We won't trust. They are demanding proof and action from God. By making this demand of God, they are taking themselves, they should be lower than God, and they are putting themselves as the tester. They are putting themselves as the authority instead of submitting to his authority and submitting to his test. These previously slaves, these hard-hardened, rebellious, ungrateful, sinful people are saying to God, you submit, you do our will, you submit to our testing. This is not how it works. The holy, perfect creator of the universe is the one who tests. He is the one whom we submit to. This moment of rebellion and testing of God will become a reoccurring theme in the history of the Israelites, in the Hebrew scriptures. In Deuteronomy 6.16, right before the second generation of Israel is about to go into the promised land, Moses warns them about this moment. He says to them, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. And then again, we see this event come up in Psalm 95, which is written hundreds of years later. And it says, Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test. And put me to proof, though they had seen my work. So this author is seeing the same thing that we're looking at. He sees their forgetfulness of the works he did. They're seeing their demand for God to prove himself. The Israelites would continue to struggle with this. They would continue to struggle with their hard-heartedness. In our passage, instead of submitting to the Lord, the people have embraced their distrust and they demand action from God. Even though this passage is only a few seven verses long, it will ripple into the rest of Scripture. Friends, the God of the universe is not our servant. We don't get to make demands on him. We don't get to force Yahweh to submit to our will. He is not some spiritual force that has to submit to spiritual laws. That if we understand those laws, then we get to manipulate God to get him to do what we want. To submit to us. That is not God. God is a loving father. God will provide. He wants to provide. And the Israelites need to move to a place where they believe that. We need to move to a place where we believe that. So let's watch him provide for Israel despite their hard hearts. Verse 3. We're only in verse 3. But the people thirsted there 
for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. So here we see a little bit deeper into the heart of the people. They don't even respond to Moses' accusation that they're testing the Lord. They just ignore that, go around, and they're ready to kill Moses. However, even in this moment of high stress, of extreme difficulty for Moses, we see his faithfulness. He goes to the Lord. He intercedes for these people who are threatening to kill him. He still intercedes for them. He goes to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? And the Lord answers, verse 5. And the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. So this is an interesting callback to the Nile. God sees the people, they are not remembering. They are forgetting all the work that he has done for them up to this point. And so, in part, this callback is to remind them, like, don't forget everything I have done for you, starting with the very first plague where Moses struck the Nile. And then think with me, all those things up to this point. In six months, they have witnessed 10... Oh, hold on. We got back up. I missed my point. Israel needed to remember God's work. That's our first, uh, you know, but I already gave it to you at the beginning, so that's why I, you didn't need it. Just keep going. Israel needed to remember God's work. In six months, in less than six months, the people had witnessed the ten plagues in Egypt. They witnessed the pillar of cloud and fire that was leading them. They experienced themselves, the splitting of the Red Sea going through it, and then after that, it closing on Pharaoh and his armies to protect them. They experienced salvation by the waters, the bitter waters turning sweet. The saving, the sending of the manna and the quail and the promise for it to come every single day being fulfilled up to this point. Yet they still doubt... Let me start that one over. They still doubted God's provision. They still didn't trust his goodness. And they yell to him, give us water to drink. Are you even with us? Prove yourself. They just will not remember. But don't judge. Don't judge too quickly. How many of us are like this? So quickly, we forget God's provision. We forget God's... I almost said judgment. That's not the word. Provision, his miracles, his blessings every single day. We forget the blessings and provision that he gives us, our families, our children, our jobs, our cars, the breakfast that is sitting in our stomachs right now, a body that works mostly for most of us. All the beauty of the East Tennessee mountains, all of this life-giving rain that we're experiencing, our wonderful spouses, political freedom, the lack of war on our front door, the freedom to worship, salvation from hell, fresh water that we are drinking. Even the air in our lungs is a gift from God that we are not worthy of. So often we come to God with our doubts and our despair, forgetting how good he is to us every single day. Personally, I have been in a season of stress. Personally, I have gone to God and said, God, you've got to do something. You've got to change this. In a sense, saying, prove yourself. Except ours usually doesn't look like demanding water. We demand an obedient child. We demand different jobs. We demand a different body, a different house, a new car, a new spouse. Success in our definitions. 
Give me miraculous freedom from my addiction, but without work. Take away my suffering. Prove yourself, God. Just like the Israelites, we so easily forget. I so easily forget. And we overlook God's amazing blessings, his daily provision, the miracles he has done in our lives. Exodus 17 is not only commentary on the hearts of the Egyptians, but it's commentary on your heart. It's commentary on the human condition. We need to remember God's works. We need to remember God's works. But despite our hard hearts, just as with Israel, God will provide because he is patient, because he is loving. Let's watch him provide for Israel. Let's continue with verse 6. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the, pit, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. I love how God not only provides for their physical need, he provides water, but he also provides for their emotional need. They're saying, prove yourself. He said, all right, I'm going to stand right here as this rock pours out water. I'm here. You can see me. I am for you. He provides for their physical need and their emotional need. It does not tell us what his presence looked like. That's not the point. The point is his presence was visible. So this visual that we have of God being particularly present with water coming out to provide life is a visual that we will see again through Scripture. We see it in Psalm 80, 78, 16, which says, He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. But then the same author in the same psalm takes a turn and he calls God the rock, like God is the rock. A little lower in verse 35, it says, They remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer. And then Psalm 95 picks that up as well. It says in verse 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. What are they saying? They're saying there was nothing magic about the rock. It was God. God provided that source of life. And then Paul in the New Testament, he goes a little bit further down that road. Paul, just like the other apostles, just like the other New Testament writers, understood that Jesus was God. They understood his words. They understood the prophecies he was fulfilling. They understood Jesus is God. God. So then Paul is saying, okay, it's simple algebra. If Jesus, if the God is rock, and if Jesus is God, then Jesus is the rock. Whoa. And he mentions this in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And all the Israelites drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now, there's not a literal rock following them around the desert, like scooting in the sand, uh, pouring out water. Paul says it's a spiritual rock. What Paul means is this. God provided their life, like they're sustaining. Throughout the wilderness, it was not a rock, it was God. And what Paul is saying is Jesus is that God. And so here's the bonus point that I didn't tell you in the beginning. You've been paying attention up to this point for an A. Here it is. Jesus was the source of life back then, just as he is now. Jesus is the source of life back then, just as he is now. So let's pick it up with our last verse of our section. Exodus 17, verse 7. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel. And because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? So what's up with these names? 
Well, it's pretty straightforward. Massa means test, and Meribah means quarrel, unless I've gotten those reversed. Moses is using these names to communicate to future generations. Whenever they hear this story, whenever they, uh, those places are mentioned, they remember, oh yeah, not only did God do that work, but the people quarreled and they tested God. And we do the same thing in modern times. I mean, look at the city of Greenville. Look at the county of Green, named after Nathaniel Green. Why? Because of all the things, right? Because of all the things that he did, which we all know, right? We all remember what Nathaniel Green did. (laughs) Okay, I'll tell you. Nathaniel Green led the Southern Continental Army under George Washington against the British forces in Virginia, Georgia, South Carolina, eroding British control over the American South. We all know that. I went to, I went to the Nathaniel Green Museum. I forgot it, though. I had no idea. So truthfully, raise your hand, and you guys too, Afton, South Green, who knew that about Nathaniel Green? Okay, a few. Very good. Well, for all the rest of us who have forgotten, look at us. We know something about Nathaniel Green now. We know who he was. We know what he did, you know, at least partly. And the same thing is happening in our passage. Moses knows that Israel needs to remember God's work. And so he puts this memory tool right there. Anytime you talk about the story and where it happened, you're going to remember the people quarreled and they tested God as a warning. Don't do this. Don't be like this generation. So I have some bad news. If we were to do a quick survey of Israel's time in the wilderness, we will see them fail and fail and fail, and they quarrel and grumble with the Lord ten times. They never get there. They never get to the point to where they are faithful and trusting God. I have some more bad news. The next generation doesn't. They do better, but they don't get there either. And then the next generation doesn't, and the next generation doesn't, and nobody gets there. And that's the point. Nobody is faithful. Nobody remembers the works of God. But one does. One person does. Jesus Christ did. Did you know that he had a temptation in the wilderness just the same as these Israelites? Right after he was baptized by John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit took him into the wilderness for 40 days. So that 40 in wilderness should take the reader's mind back to this passage. And you can read this in Matthew 4. And so then if we look at the three temptations Christ faced, and really dig in and study it, we will see that they, par- they almost said paralyzed, they parallel Israel's testing and struggles in the wilderness. And so we don't have time to go through all of them, but we're going to look at the most pertinent one, the second one. And so Satan suggests to Jesus, hey, you should go up to the pinnacle of the, the, the temple and throw yourself off because the scriptures say God will catch you. Force God's hand. Make him do something. And how does Jesus respond? He quotes Deuteronomy 6.16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. But when we go back to Deuteronomy 6.16 and read the context, we realize it's talking about our passage today. As in, don't put God to the test like that generation did at Meribah. So what does this mean? It means that this test over here, that Israel failed miserably and then failed and then failed and then failed and then failed. Jesus passed. Jesus passed the test. And then if we study the Gospels, we will see Jesus pass test after test after test after test. He is the ultimate faithful son of God. And then his life will lead him up to the, the, the final test, 
the test of the cross. And we will see Jesus struggling with this test very much. And we will see him go to the garden and pray. And he will pray, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then Jesus submitted to the the test. And he passed the test. And his passing of this test means salvation for you. He trusted the Lord, that the Lord knew what was best, that the Lord had what was best in mind for Jesus, that the Lord had what was best in mind for you. He believed the works of God, and he passed the test. And because he submitted to that test and passed that test, all of the sheep of God, all of the people of God are drawn to the Father because of him. And salvation is free because of him. And our sin is paid for because of him. Jesus remembered God's works. Jesus remembered God's works. And he did it faithfully. So moving on to our last point. God wants us to remember his works. As God leads the Israelites through the wilderness into the promised land, and then continues to lead them throughout their history, God tells them to write things down, to build altars, to celebrate festivals and different things to remember his works, kind of like the festival of the Passover. He regularly is giving them memory tools to remember the things that he is doing for them. Why? Because when his people remember his works, They learn to trust him. They learn to submit and to follow him. They live happier lives with less anxiety. Who wants less anxiety? I do. They honor the the people when they trust the Lord. They honor their parents. They don't covet each other's things and steal. They don't try to kill one another when water is low. Trusting Trusting God's works makes everyone's life better. God wants us to remember his works. It is for our own good and for his glory when we remember his works. So here I have two application questions for you. The first one. How can you purposefully remember God's work in your life? How can you purposefully Key word, underline it, bold it. Purposefully remember God's works. There are plenty of ways you can do this. You can be creative. Several times throughout Scripture, it even comes up in our passage for next week. God tells Moses, write this down. Write this down. What I did for you, write it down. So that's a great place. We can all start there. Let's write it down. People keep journals writing down prayers, the answers to those prayers, blessings, miracles from God. I've heard this idea of taking a jar and then papers and just every day or so writing something down God has blessed you with, provided you with, tearing that up, put it in the jar. And then every now and then the jar is full, you can dump it out and just review all of God's work in your life, all of his provision. I think I'm going to try that one. I'm going to put it, Bethany, I'm going to put a jar next to, next to the bed. I'm talking to my wife, if you, didn't know, if you didn't know. She's my wife. God sometimes told Israel to build altars. Like not sacrificial altars, but just altars of memory. And so they would see this thing, the structure that they built, and remember what God did in that moment. Maybe you need to build something. Maybe you need a visual thing that you put your hands together to do work. And then when you see that thing, oh yeah, God did X, Y, Z in my life. Like not in an idealistic idealistic way of, of it becoming some kind of a worshipful altar thing, but just as a memory tool, a visual cue of God's work in your life. I told you in the beginning of my sermon that 
I have to practice names. I have to practice names if I'm going to keep them. If I stopped, I'd, I'd lose so many names. Like, they just don't stick. So I've got to practice. So then why don't I practice remembering God's work in my life? Why don't I practice God's work in my life, remembering it? How can you purposefully remember God's work in your life? Application question number two. Are you testing the Lord? If you are, stop it. In our difficult times, are you looking to God, making demands, and asking for proofs? Are you trying to pressure God into action in your life? Are you trying to force God to your will and your timing? Are you saying, God, change this, remove this, and if you don't, I'm not following you? Me following you is dependent on you submitting to me. Don't test the Lord. But rather follow Christ's example. It's okay to say, God, change this, move this, remove this, add this. But then that prayer should be followed up with a heart that says, but not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Friends, let's look at our two application questions. Let's reflect on these for, let's do 30 seconds. How can you purposefully remember God's work in your life? Are you testing the Lord? Let's pray together, friends. God, every single day, we can record your provision, your goodness, miracles that you've performed on our behalf. I ask that you would help us to remember them. Help us to purposefully spend time reflecting on them so that we can come to a place to where we trust you where we lose trust in ourselves, but that we rely on you in times of distress, in times of difficulty. You are our good Father, and we thank you for that. Steer us away from testing you. Help us to see when we are, to repent of it, to turn away and say, your will and not ours be done. Thank you for Jesus, the faithful one, Thank you for Jesus, the tests that he successfully passed, his death on the cross for our sin. We are grateful for him and for your love for us before we even knew you. We praise your name. Amen.